Thank you, Matt, for leading us uh, so well in worship. Um, especially in light of the topic, I hope that you can say confidently, it is well with my soul regardless of the circumstances of life. I want to open with a letter that was written to a spiritual friend in the 16th century. And this is how the letter goes. My dear friend, the season of hardship continues to press on me. There is no end to the trials God has seen fit for me to endure. My every hope for justice has been dashed. Those who oppose me mock me openly now. My feeble words are not a threat to their deceit. I no longer hope to recover what has been taken from me. More than that, I see little hope for the future. You have reminded me that there is a difference between what we think God should do for us and what God actually does for us. There is a difference between who we imagine God to be and who he actually is. I do want God to do more for me. I'm afraid to admit that I may no longer want to entrust myself to him. I confess to you, my friend, that I have considered living life by what seems right in my eyes, by the rules of this city that makes for power and for success. I long for ease in life. At times, I long for it more than I long for the presence of my Lord. The darkness of the season covers my soul. I eagerly await your arrival, your prayers, and your encouragement, your friend. I don't know if you have ever felt like this in life, when you went through a season that was just too much to bear. When you looked out and everyone else's life seemed to be going well and you were the one who was carrying heavy, heavy burdens. Psalm, 20, psalm 73 is the psalm that addresses this very issue. Please turn with me in your Bibles to this psalm, Psalm 73. The psalm begins the third book in the whole five books of psalms and is also the first psalm in a collection of songs written by Asaph. He has 11 psalms in a row, each one very powerful in its own right. Psalm 73 is categorized as a wisdom psalm, and knowing that uh, helps us with the reading strategy, because we know that we can expect to read about some lessons learned in this psalm. And my goal this morning is to walk through the psalm together, and at the end to ask you to tell me what your takeaways are, your reflection, how you sense God speaking to you through this psalm. So as we read it together, I encourage you to just pay attention to words or thoughts that stand out to you. Make a note of them so that you can share them at the end. The writer of this psalm is second only to David in uh, psalm composition and in worship. We know that Asaph was a Levite, which means he was a professional in ministry. And his specialty was leading worship, composing lyrics uh, and music to facilitate worship. That is to help God's people to meet with God. He was kind of an ancient Robin Mark or Paul Beloche or... Matt Peters, I suppose. <laughs> uh, we read about him in First Chronicles 16, starting in verse 4, uh, where we read about David appointing him. It says, David appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord when it was brought into Jerusalem and the ta um, tabernacle worship was established there to celebrate and to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel. Asaph was the chief of these worship leaders, and there were others on his team. There was Zechariah, Jael, Shemiramoth, Jael, Mattathiah, and so on. And they used musical instruments such as harps and lyres. And we also find out that Asaph apparently was a drummer. He was the one who used the loud cymbals. So I think that explains a lot of the emotions that we read about in his psalms. Uh, the others had trumpets uh, that they blew continually before for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and it was on that day that David first assigned Asaph and his relatives, the Levites, to give thanks to the Lord. And if you read on in the chapter of Chronicles, you read that this is how they started. This was kind of their first worship service there. And they say, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. 
That, does that sound familiar? Do we still sing that today? We do. Psalm 105 actually opens with these words. Sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders, glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his wonderful deeds which he has done, his marvels and the judgments that he has spoken. O seed of Israel, his servants, son of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God and his judgments are in all the earth. That is the kind of worship that Asaph would lead. And in, when we turn to Psalm 73, we begin one of his worship songs there. Uh, and it opens with verse 1, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And we expect him to break out into these great praises of worship. Because this is a man who knows the Lord God, who knows how to express his faith, and how to inspire others to worship and toward a higher walk with God. But this man experiences a serious shaking of his own faith, kind of a personal spiritual crisis. And that is the, the next verse, verse 2. He says, but as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet slipped. I stumbled. I came, I, I almost fell over. As for me, surely God is good to Israel, to all those who are pure in heart. But as for me, I have lost my footing about that. He continues to tell us why was that? What was the cause that someone like this would lose their confidence even in his own faith? And it says in verse 4, Because I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. In fact, it says they don't even die painful deaths. Literally, it's like they, they live happy and painlessly right to the point of dying. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with the same kinds of problems that everyone else seems to have. And so they wear their pride like a necklace. They show off their arrogance, and they clothe themselves with violence and with cruelty. It says these fat cats, is the NLT translation, these fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They mock and they wickedly speak of oppression. They boast against the very heavens and their words strut and roam throughout all the earth. Heaven and earth are filled with their mocking, their arrogance, their violence, their pride. And so the people are dismayed and confused. They're drinking in all their words. And the kinds of things that these people say is, what does God know? And does the Most High, which is a high worship name for God, does the Most High even know what is going on on this earth and in my life and what I'm doing and what you're doing? And Asaph says, behold, these are the wicked. Look at these wicked people. They're enjoying a life of ease while their money is making money. Their riches are multiplying. Can you identify with Asaph here? So he kind of looks out on the world and he says, what is going on? Have you ever become a bit disoriented because things in the world are not as they ought to be, as God says they ought to be? If God is good and if he punishes wrongdoers and he rewards good, then why do the godly suffer and the arrogant and the wealthy, those who deny him, prosper? Did, did you ever second guess whether living for Jesus was the right choice to make? Would life have been easier on a different path? Because Asaph does, he asks himself the question in verse 13, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? Or actually, uh, he says it more strongly, originally he says, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. Surely in vain I have washed my hands in innocence. What is it all for? 
perhaps a fellow Christian uh, asks you this kind of a question if it has never occurred to you. Because uh, many contemplate whether life away from the faith would be easier. Whether it would just be more about me instead of more about God and about others. Is all the giving and serving and effort that we put into following Christ, is it worth it? I sat in a junior high class years ago and one of the junior high kids actually asked this very question. He says, well, how is it that you know, all the bad people are rich and famous. And the teacher very quickly answered, well, they may be rich, but they're not happy. And I thought, you know what, that's a pat answer. Because riches don't necessarily bring unhappiness, but poverty sure does. And um, I, uh, on the long weekend, I was reminded of a country song that is also struggling with this issue. And the country song says, I know everyone says money can't buy happiness, but it could buy me a boat, and it could buy me a truck to pull it. <laughs> and those things kind of make for a better life than what I have now, <laughs> right? So just because somebody is rich and wealthy, we can't just say, well, they can't possibly be happy with all that money, right? That's, um, that's pretty simplistic kind of thinking. So Asaph very courageously faces this conundrum. He doesn't just, uh, you know, uh, sweep it away or give pat answers to it. He says, how is it, how does this happen? How is it that the rich, you know, have you seen their shalom? Because that's the word he uses for prosperity. Their shalom and prosperity. Have you seen their ease of life? Have you seen their happiness, their freedom from worry? And on the other hand, have you seen the suffering of the godly and the suffering of the innocent? Have you seen those who turn their back on God, who openly mock him, and yet they grow in power? And have you wondered if living by God's word really pays off or would, would, should you find another way? Is all the giving, helping, serving, and sacrificing for others worth it when those without God live a good life and those who love and serve Him often suffer? And something that is not true that we tend to maybe um, advertise is that faith in Jesus comes with a guarantee of freedom from adversity. And it's not true. In fact, too many of our evangelistic appeals are tainted with kind of a false promise, implied or stated that coming to Jesus uh, will spare you from trials of life. And when life proves that this is not the case, the faith of the people is sometimes shaken. So Psalm 73, Asaph, kind of takes us through a very typical process that we see in many of the Psalms, a process of orientation, disorientation, and then a reorientation. The orientation comes at the beginning, which is you and I every morning, perhaps, or even this morning, we make a personal commitment to God. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. That is our foundation, that is our starting point. The disorientation comes when life proves that this is not so. When there's doubt cast on this, such as the happy life or the happiness of the ungodly versus the hardship of the godly. And Asaph is struggling here actually with an attitude of envy. You know, he's not distressed so much by the sin of the successful as he's distressed by the success of the sinful. He's fretting over the fact that those who reject God seem to be happy, wealthy, and healthy. And Psalm 37 verse 1 addresses this very thing. It says, do not fret because of evil men. Do not be envious of those who do wrong and seem to have a happy life. So he's in this disorientation and he says, I don't, I don't like it here. He decides to do something about it. So his next step is, I want to understand what is going on. I want to understand the dissonance between surely God is good to those who are pure in heart and how is it that those who are not pure in heart are happy and I'm apparently not. 
You see, he, he talks, I, I skip verse 14, he says, Me, on the other hand, I, am, I, I have troubles every day. Every morning brings a new set of problems. So he chooses to understand. In verse 15, If I had said these kinds of things, though, he says, to other people, I realized that I would have betrayed your people. You know, imagine if Matt came up this Sunday morning to lead us in worship and he said, you know, I know we think God is good to people, but frankly, my week has been terrible and I'm not sure if it's actually true. (laughs) How can you lead people in worship like that? So Asaph says, I can't really stand on a stage and lead worship from those words, but I'm going to sort it out for myself, see where I land. So he says in verse 16, so I try to understand why the wicked prosper. And he says, that's a really tough thing to figure out. It's a very difficult task to get there. So Asaph actually shares the outcome of his struggle only after he has resolved it. And I really appreciate his honesty on the one hand, because he does name the problem, but also the concern for God's people on the other hand. And it is when his struggle can help us, that is when he shares it. He turns it into a song, song that God inspired, kept for us, that was part of worship, uh, and that is helpful to us. When he's in the middle of the struggle, he, he struggles with it probably with a, privately with a few of those who are um, close to him. So how does he reorient himself out of this disorientation? Well, it begins in verse 17, and it begins with a focus on God. In verse 17 of the psalm, there's a dramatic shift in the pronouns that are used. The first psalm of the first half of the psalm is focused all on the wicked. They and them is what Asaph is talking about, looking at, thinking about. Starting from verse 17, you is the pronoun that is used as Asaph's attention and focus turns to God. In verse 17, he says, Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I understood something. I perceived, I saw the end of these people that I'm so jealous of. Verse 17 is a pivot point in the psalm. Asaph finds a way, a place to meet with God, a a way that changes his perspective on what he's observing. And what he sees is, truly you put them on a slippery path. Send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. And their end can come in an instant. And they are completely then swept away. When you arise, O Lord, um, these things that that I'm so concerned about, these dreams and the power they have, um, is as fleeting as a dream that I dream at night. In verse 21 says, I actually realized that my heart was bitter. I was embittered and I was all torn up inside. And in that state, I was like a senseless animal in verse 22. I was foolish and I was ignorant. So what is it that causes this dramatic shift from this disorientation? Life is not fair. I'm not sure that living for God is worth it to... I walked into the sanctuary and suddenly I saw the, the, the way things really are. Well, Asaph would have served in the sanctuary, sanctuary um, uh, frequently. And perhaps what he saw was, first of all, the door on the outside of that fence. That there is only one way to come to God. And then the square altar on which sacrifices were burnt signifying that, no, there is a judgment and there is a payment before you can come to God. And the labor with water for washing, that there is a cleansing that has to happen before you can come to God. On the inside, there are a number of other articles reminding him of God. The lamp on the left side is a picture of there are two ways to live. You can live in the darkness or you can live in the light. And then inside the Holy of Holies, which represents heaven, it represents another reality, which is the ultimate reality, which is the the truth behind the unseen. Uh, He didn't see it, but he would know that there would be the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark was God's throne. 
This is where God would rule from, reside from. This was his seat. And he would sit under the coverings of the angels. And that seat is called mercy. And it covers, first of all, the law. The stone tablets that say you shall do this and you shall not do this. And if you fail, you will die. That God's mercy covers that. He would see, he would know there is a jar of manna inside that speaks of God's provision. And God's provision, especially when you are in the desert, when you are in dry places, when there is no fruit to pick from, from around you, that God provides in those dry times, in those hard times. And he would see Aaron's rod that budded, which speaks of the fact that God chooses his representatives that we approach God on his terms and not on our terms. The whole worship center, tabernacle, was a huge object lesson that explained to the people who God was and how things really worked in the universe. And we stand on the other side of the cross and we look to Jesus and we know, well, of course, he is the door. He is the one way to Christ, to God. He is the sacrifice that was made and he's the cleansing that has been um, made on our behalf that cleanses us. He's the light that guides us. He's the bread. He's the altar of incense because he intercedes for us. And of course, he is the king on the throne. And so as Asaph meets with God, he gains this eternal perspective and he realizes that here on earth, temporarily, things are not as they seem. He gets a new perspective on prosperity and also on suffering. New perspective on God and the whole of human existence. And then he looks back into his disorientation. He looks back at the time when he says, I, you know, I was so embittered. And he recognizes that it was caused by this jealousy and embitterment. And it resulted in him being like a senseless animal, like King Nebuchadnezzar, who became literally an animal until he came to his senses as Asaph comes to his senses through this encounter with God in the tabernacle and reorients him to reality. And after that happens in Psalm 73, starting in verse 23, then he says, this is the result of my encounter with God. I still belong to you. Nevertheless, he says, I am with you. And not only that, that you are holding God, my right hand. Your right hand or the right hand is considered the right as uh, the hand of power. So when my power, my strength isn't enough, it doesn't matter because God is holding my hand of power. With your counsel, you guide me and eventually you will receive me in glory. Lead me to a glorious destiny. Verse 25 is a verse to be memorized and prayed for, I believe. And this is where sort of a, a contemplative moment for Asaph. He says, whom have I in heaven but you? In other words, why do I even care about my eternal destiny? Is it because it will be painless? Is it because there I will not be sick? Is it because there everything I need will be provided for me? Is it because there labor will be easy? He says, no, actually, it is because you will be there, God. That's heaven. But he says, and here on earth, while I'm here, I desire nothing more than you. Now, I have spent many days, I frequently take this psalm, it is my encounter with God, and I pray and say, is this really true? Can I really say that I desire nothing on this earth more than God. Asaph says, actually, I've come to a place where I desire you more this life of ease that I have been jealous of and observing in others. Jesus said this, you know, set your heart first on the kingdom of God and all the details of life and the other priorities will work themselves out. Asaph continues in verse 26, 
My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. In verse 27, he says, there are two kinds of people. There are those who desert him and those who will perish. And he says, you know, I was almost one of those. I was almost one who thought it is better on the other side. But now I know that if I went there, um, I would perish, that death would be my end, eternal, eternal death. But as for me, now the psalm opens with that. There is an inclusio, there is a connection from the last piece of the psalm to the very beginning. The psalm opens with, surely God is good to Israel. But as for me, I almost slipped. The psalm ends with, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. It's not just that God is good to his people in general, but a conviction that the nearness of God is my personal good. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and now I can tell everyone, I will tell everyone, about the wonderful things that you do. So we see his struggle. He depicts it. He writes a song about it. It becomes part of the songbook of the temple worship. It's preserved for us. And we see that his struggle was valuable. It was valuable to him. It's valuable to us. Because it led to a renewed conviction that the ultimate good in life is knowing God and being near him, having him near us. And so his struggle ends with this renewed confidence in God's reign, in his power, in his goodness, in the reality of God and in a reality of goodness in the presence of a life in the presence of God. His reorientation leads to a greater maturity that he had before the struggle and a higher understanding of God. So there is wisdom. Psalm 23, uh, Psalm 73 actually is considered to be one of the greatest wisdom psalms of the 150 psalms that we have. There are many others. Uh, This one is considered to be uh, the wisdom psalm. And so I want to ask you now, what what do you see in this? What do you take away from this? What do you notice, or how has God spoken to you as we read through this, these 28 verses? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carrie. I don't know if you heard, but it was that this has been a recent experience, uh, and perhaps it's a repeated experience. And I would say probably for young people, it may be uh, a question that is asked, is it worth it to live for Jesus? Because it does cost, you know, is the cost worth it? And to be reminded and to be, um, to be told, you know, the eternal perspective is what's critical for us to have. Thank you. Other thoughts? Kristen? Yes, yes. So, so actually not even fearing that doubt or fearing if that question comes up, I think the longer you're with Jesus, the less often it comes around, but just to know what to do, that it is to go into that place where you meet with God. For Asaph, it was the sanctuary, probably for Kristen is with her guitar somewhere, right? (laughs) Or over the piano with music. Wherever it is, however you would significantly be able to meet with God, Honestly, say, lay your struggles before him and allow him to speak to you. Other thoughts? Dave? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, there are others. Uh, There are other psalms perhaps to go to because there is actually only one psalm that just hangs with the negative. There is no resolution because sometimes that is the experience of life. Uh, the negative is not that I have lost my confidence in God, but that God didn't resolve my problems. I trust him, but he didn't fix really anything about my life. 
I think the difference between a, 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 a TV show where you have a crisis and then a resolution and a happy ending and this is how this moves our heart. Um, and I think if you sit quietly with the words of God's word and let the Holy Spirit move you, you can feel um, there is an inner witness that this is true. Exactly. So Matt said that sometimes the social media will show, uh, we, we think, is it really, are they really that happy and is their life really that good? And sometimes the answer is yes, it really is. <laughs> um, but then you ended with the focus and this is what uh, changes Asaph's um, situation. He ch he's looking at the happy life of those who mock God and it, it is distressing to him when he, his focus changes to look at who God is. This becomes secondary. It becomes almost inconsequential. I have a few points to finish with. First of all, I would say that uh, we are not meant to live in disorientation. If any sort of doubt arises, uh, I think the wrong thing to do is just ignore it, suppress it, not face it. The right thing to do is like Asaph, name it, face it, bring it before God, bring it to those in your circle who can help you with that. Living where doubt kind of niggles at us and plagues us is um, not, a, not a place where we're meant to live. And part of that is do not be afraid to wrestle these things out with God. The incongruities of life uh, pose the big questions to him with courage. Thirdly, as Kristen mentioned, know how to meet with God for yourself, to, to uh, find a place uh, that is a, a, a constant uh, sort of a confident place where you know God will meet with you. Ultimately it is to decide where your allegiances lie because coming back and living in this cycle is also difficult. Uh, returning to the question is the grass greener on the other side or can you say with Asaph once and for all the nearness of God is my good and I desire him nothing more. I'm living, I desire him than nothing else on this earth. I'm living with rightly ordered desires, as some would say, that God is my highest priority, and then I can want all kinds of other things, but if he comes first, everything else will be rightly ordered. And I would say finally, evaluate your current testimony. Uh, in verse 28, uh, Asaph says, As for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made God my refuge so that I can tell of all his works. It is difficult to confidently tell others of God's greatness if we are living in disorientation, when doubt is plaguing us. And we have been talking about good neighboring and about the case for Christ. But I think it's very challenging to tell others of God's power when living for Jesus has not made a transforming impact in my own life. Uh, that is not a testimony of a lack of God's power, but a testimony of my ability to appropriate it. Head knowledge is, will not do. It's our commitment to Christ that makes effective witness possible. Bonhoeffer was the one who also wrestled with this question. He said, who am I really? And after a long, long uh, season of wrestling, he came to the conclusion, I am thine, O God. I exist for you. And he found in that decision and conviction a freedom and power to live a life that reaches way beyond the grave to influence the world even today. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so grateful that you have chosen for us not to live our faith out alone, but that you have placed us in community here in um, this church, in our small groups, in our serving teams, um, and also of the community of those who have gone before us. Even Asaph is one of our community, of people who have had to figure out what it means to live for you. We thank you for the experience that he has had, the way that he has processed it, and the, the way that you have preserved it for us. May we find courage, may we find answers, may we find direction 
in these words. In your name we pray. Amen.